Mr. Chairman, it is vital to emphasize this problem of disarmament. And I suggest that this conference should call upon the powers of the world to disarm. They must disarm in order to ensure that they are unable to strike against each other. And Mr. Chairman, from this conference, let us give them a positive maximum. If you want peace, stop preparing for war. Why peace, peace, and yet there is no peace? Only last night, the Soviet Union exploded a nuclear device. This is a shock to me, as it must have been to you all. But it is a shock which possibly brings home to us the supreme danger facing mankind, the imperative necessity for peace, and the urgent need to sign a treaty for complete and general disarmament. This, today, is far the most dangerous situation that has arisen in the last 15 years or so since the last war ended. Now we all talk. It has become a commonplace for people in every country to refer to the dangers of modern nuclear warfare. <coughs> Although we talk about it, I am not so sure that even those who talk about it fully and emotionally realize what this means. We talk about the destruction of civilization, the destruction of humanity, of the human race, if nuclear war comes. Well, if that is so, then that requires something much more, some, some greater effort, some greater uh, uh, attempt on our part to try to do what we can to avoid it. I know that the key to the situation does not lie in the hands of this Congress or any, uh, any other Congress or conference. The key to the situation today essentially lies in the hands of two great powers, the United States of America and the Soviet Union. Distinguished delegates, I appear before you today on a sad and solemn occasion, the first meeting of the General Assembly since the murder of the Prime Minister of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba. History. be released by the new United Nations Command. That the first task of the United Nations is to allow the Congolese people to be ruled by a government of their own choice. The Congolese constitution provides a means by which such a government can be chosen. And we support the Kazenga government because it was chosen by this means and was the government that invited the United Nations to the Congo. The duty of the United Nations is not to force on the Congo this or that government, because the other states of the world think that any particular government should be a suitable one for the Congo. This is I therefore do not understand the emphasis which a number of powers lay on recognizing this or that government. Ultimately, it must be the Congolese people who choose their government and not the United Nations. 
what the United Nations must do is to see that the Congolese people have the opportunity to choose the government which they want. The present situation. My proposal is therefore that there should be, as soon as the United Nations have established law and order, a new general election conducted under United Nations supervision and under conditions where every political party can fully canvas for its policy without fear, without force, and without intimidation. Before, therefore, accepting a decision of the present Congolese parliament as an expression of the will of the nation, the United Nations must first satisfy itself that parliament is not meeting on their duress and that the balance of political forces has not been changed by organized murder. Question. Mr. President and distinguished delegates, what we need in the Congo is not a solution. That is a compromise or seek to reconcile the divergent views between East and West. What we want is a solution acceptable to the Congolese people and which ensures peace and stability in Africa and thus excludes the Cold War from the continent. As I have said many times before, we in Africa have a vested interest in peace. What is taking place in the Congo today could lead to a serious conflagration which would set us all ablaze and spare no one. Unless this unhappy and ominous train is arrested at once, a major war will descend upon us again. If the proposals I am making succeed, we will be ensuring that the world is not only safe for ourselves in Africa, but also for the big powers. I believe that the plans I have put forward are entirely realistic and practical. Most people who have said or are serving with the United Nations in the Congo would agree with me. I believe that the African point of view at the United Nations headquarters in New York has now some influence in that the Secretary General is making use of the adversary committee, but this is not enough. The African viewpoint should also be much more fully presented at the United Nations headquarters in Dupertville in both the civil and the military spheres. The United Nations headquarters in Dupertville is divided into several military sections. On the civil side, I would like to see many more experienced African in position of authority than it is at present the case. On the military side, my feelings are the same. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, action in the Congo is urgent. Up till now, the United Nations has failed in the Congo. It entered the Republic to restore law and order. Yet today, mutinous troops who roam the country committing atrocities, rapine, murder, and all forms of indiscriminate killings. There is virtual civil war. The United Nations entered the Congo with a specific mandate to preserve the unity of the Republic. Instead, under the very shadow of the United Nations, the Katanga province is being, in practice, detached from the rest of the state and converted into a new type of Belgian colony. The first task of the United Nations was to secure the withdrawal of Belgian forces. Instead, Belgium has been allowed to establish what amounts, in fact, to a military dictatorship in Katanga. Belgian military equipment is supplied to rebels and separate forces before the eyes of the United Nations forces, who are powerless to intervene. United Nations presence in the Congo had to be based upon the solid political foundation of the consent of the Congolese people.
This concern could only be expressed by the Congolese people through their elected representative, assembled in parliament, and through the government, which had been appointed by parliament in accordance with the constitution of the Congo. Instead, the United Nations stood by passively while parliament was prevented from meeting by Mobutu in command of a band of mutineers. While in theory, the United Nations acknowledged the constitution of the Congo Republic, it in fact collaborated with the very forces who denied its legitimacy. Distinguished delegates will recall that Mobutu claimed to have deposed both President Kasabubu and the government of Patrick Lumbumba and to have deposed all government that is own. He had no possible claim to exercise any legal authority. Nevertheless, the United Nations authorities in Yopeville collaborated with his so-called College of Commissioners, which he had set up, and thus gave the mutineers not only authority, but also a ready supply of cash from the resources of the Congo. This the rebels employed in furthering their mutiny and in attempting to consolidate their position in opposition both to the president and to the prime minister, Patsy Lumumba. That such action. What has happened to the principle so widely canvassed in theory that all aid should be channeled through the United Nations. The distinguished delegates of the United States, Mr. Adlet Stevenson, some little time ago, wrote an article in the London Sunday Times in which he pointed out the absolute madness of partitioning Africa economically along the pattern established in Europe. What indeed should the Congo be economically attached to the common market countries? Only one valid reason for this exists, the maintenance of Belgium's financial interest. Yet all this is going on under the shadow of the United Nations, and apparently for the active participation of the United Nations experts. There is a special voluntary United Nations Fund for restoring the Congo's economic life and carrying on its public services. The use to which this fund has been put has been a matter of great concern to us of the independent African states. It is now over three months ago since I wrote to the Secretary General. He has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the redeemer and the champion of liberty, of human equality. Let's salute him, fellow Ghanaians, the nation's founder, Saji Kwame Krumah. May God bless him, Ghana Shobar. Africa's great song, Sajj Poo Dr. Kakra, Menkasepi, 
Dame At long last, the battle has ended. And thus, Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. And here again, I want to take the opportunity to thank the chiefs and people of this country, the youth, the farmers, the women, who have so nobly fought and won this battle. Also, I want to thank the valiant ex-servicemen who have so cooperated with me in this mighty task of freeing our country from foreign rule and imperialism. And as I pointed out at our party conference at Solpon, I made it quite clear that from now on today, we are for waking, we shall no more go back to sleep anymore. Today, from now on, there is a new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. We are going to demonstrate to the world to the other nations, young as we are, that we are prepared to lay our own foundation. As I said in the assembly just minutes ago, I made it point that we are going to say that we create our own African personality and identity. Yeah. It's the only way in which we can show the world that we are ready for our own battle. But today, may I call upon you all that at this great day, let us all Remember that nothing in the world can be done unless it has the purpose and support of God. We have done the battle, and we again rededicate ourselves not only in the struggle to emancipate other territories in Africa. Our independence is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. Let us now, fellow Ghanaians, let us now ask for God's blessing. And for only two seconds, in your thousands and millions, I want to ask you to pause only for one minute and give thanks to Almighty God for having led us through obstacles, difficulties, imprisonments, hardship and suffering to have brought us to the end of our trouble today. One minute silence. Ghana is free forever. And here, I will ask the band to play the Ghana National Anthem. Freedom. 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 Fellow freedom fighters, 
comrades and friends. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to Accra and to this Conference of African Freedom Fighters and supporters of the growing movement for Africa's liberation and unity. Africa is rich and not poor. Africa has immense actual and potential wealth. Gold, diamond, copper, manganese, bauxite, iron ore, uranium, asbestos, chrome, cobalt, a host of other minerals. <laughs> Our essential agricultural produce have all been drained away by colonialist imperialism. Africa is far from being poor. It is Africans who are poor, not Africa. <laughs> and they are poor because of the uncounted profit that has been made out of the exploitation of their labor and their lands. I raise this point so that it will stay in your minds when you may be tempted by the seductive promises of new colonialism to forget the real character of colonialist imperialism and be persuaded away from your own true interests and those of Africa. For today, we must each see ourselves as part of Africa in order that we may face colonialist imperialism and its new form, new colonialism, on a continent-wide front. Make First, the attainment of freedom and independence. Secondly, the consolidation of that freedom and independence. Thirdly, the creation of a unity and community between the free African states. Fourth, the economic and social reconstruction of Africa. As I see it, our greatest danger stems from this unity and the inability to see that the realization of our hopes and aspirations, the realization of our objective of total African independence and of our future progress and prosperity is in extrapolate, bound up with the necessity to unify our policy and actions in connection with the continuous struggle for independence and the greater tax of economic and social reconstruction beyond it. We must therefore face the issue of African unity now, for only unity will make the artificial boundaries and regional demarcations imposed by colonialism obsolete and superfluous. African unity will thus provide an effective remedy for border disputes and internecine troubles. In a united Africa, there could be no frontier claims between Ethiopia and Somalia, or between Zanzibar and Kenya. Guinea or Liberia, or between Ghana, Togoland, and the Ivory Coast. Because because we would, we would regard ourselves as one great continental family of nations. Some of the leaders, it must be confessed, do not see the struggle of their brother Africans as part of their own struggle. Even if they did, they would not be free to express their solidarity. These rifts are consciously created by the imperialists between Africans, where they can sit back and watch with sly satisfaction, as well as contempt for those who fail to see how they are being used against Africa's best interests. Regrettably, regrettably, those states include some who were among the freedom fighters of yesterday and who haven't won their independence are willing to drop it for some token, token aid and thereby deny to those still struggling for freedom even their moral support. Here is a phenomenon against which all African freedom fighters must be on their guard and resist to the utmost. Even though I appreciate the difficulties facing us, 
I must admit, I find it strange to watch some of us returning wi willingly to the colonialist fold. This time, they don't even have to, they don't even have the excuse of being forced to subject themselves to foreign domination. It makes one wonder. Why so much effort and sacrifice and so many lives were given up to the achievement of independence in the first place if it can only be so quickly and easily surrendered? We must begin to build immediately our own continental common market. For it is easy for every anyone who studies the common market organization closely to realize, to realize that the common market is aimed at harnessing the African countries to satisfy the profit loss of the imperialist bloc and to prevent us from following an independent neutralist policy. It is easy to see that the imperialists and the colonialists are determined to retain the African countries in the position of suppliers of cheap raw materials. If we do not resist this threat, and if we throw in our lot with the common market, we shall doom the economy of Africa to a state of perpetual subjection to the economy of Western Europe. This will, of course, hinder the industrialization of our young African states. It is impossible to think of economic development and national independence without possessing an unfettered capacity for maintaining a strong industrial power. The activities of the common market are therefore fraught with dangerous political and economic consequences for the independent African states. The, organi the organization constitutes an attempt to replace the old system of colonial exploitation by a new system of collective colonialism which will be stronger and more dangerous than the old evils we are striving to liquidate from our continent. This is another reason why we should come together in a unified African economic plan which, operating on a continental scale, can make a solid attack on the imperialist domination in Africa. We should, without delay, aim at the creation of a joint African military command. There is little wisdom in our present separate effort to build up and maintain defense forces, which in any case would be ineffective in a major world conflict. If we examine this problem realistically, we would ask, which single African state could protect itself against an imperialist aggressor? And how much more difficult this would be when some states are allowing the imperialists to maintain bases on their territories? I have already referred to the military forces which South Africa is raising and the danger it poses for the new African states and the struggle of those still in chains. Only our unity can provide us with anything like adequate protection. Those problems can best be met within a unified Africa. And it should be possible in the higher reaches of our endeavor to devise a constitutional structure which will secure, which will secure the objectives I have outlined, and yet preserve the sovereignty of each of the countries joining the Union. Countries within the Union will naturally maintain their own constitutions, continue to use their own national emblems and national anthems and other symbols and paraphernalia of sovereignty. Regional associations and territorial groupings can only be other forms of balkanization unless they are conceived within the framework of a continental union. There are existing models which can modify, which we can modify or adapt to our pattern. 
the United States of America, the Soviet Union, India and China have proved the efficacy of unions embracing large stretches of land and population. Long live African freedom fighters. Long live African independence. Long live your struggle. Kind cannot escape the constant threat of war. Africa therefore appealed to the United Nations to live up to its reputation as the greatest bastion of world peace and demands that a meeting of this year's United Nations session should be devoted to the problem of colonialism in Africa. It is folly. It is folly for the colonialists to think that they can hold back forever the progress of history. The process of change is inherent in the interplay of social, economic, and political forces. It is true that these can be hindered and impeded and even bent to different purposes, but not forever. <laughs> However, we who are concerned with the immediacy of African independence and unity are not prepared to wait upon the evolution of history. We are determined to give history a revolutionary push. We must adopt a positive all-out anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist attack and this quickly for we cannot afford the luxury of delay. Time acts for the enemy, no less than for ourselves. Let us therefore examine our position seriously and objectively to see how well we have managed so far and evaluate our points of weakness and the necessary remedies. Let us, let us determine what modifications are needed to adjust our strategy to counter the movements of the enemy and overcome him. This requires some plain speaking. And for the sake of Africa, let us speak plainly. As I see it, our greatest danger stems from disunity and the inability to see that the realization of our hopes and aspirations, the realization of our objective of total African independence, and of our future progress and prosperity is in next couple day, bound up with the necessity to unify our policy and actions in connection with the continued struggle for independence and the greater tax of economic and social reconstruction beyond it. We must therefore face the issue of African unity now, for only unity will make the artificial boundaries and regional demarcations imposed by colonialism obsolete and superfluous. African unity will thus provide an effective remedy for border disputes and internecine troubles. In a united Africa, there could be no frontier claims between Ethiopia and Somalia, or between Zanzibar and Kenya, Guinea or Liberia, or between Ghana, Togoland and the Ivory Coast. Because because we, we would regard ourselves as one great continental family of nations. Some of the leaders, it must be confessed, do not see the struggle of their brother Africans as part of their own struggle. Even if they did, they would not be free to express their solidarity. This rifts are consciously created by the imperialists between the Africans, where they can sit back and watch with sly satisfaction, as well as contempt 
for those who fail to see how they are being used against Africa's best interests. Regrettably, regrettably, those states include some who were among the freedom fighters of yesterday and who haven't won their independence are willing to drop it for some token, token aid and thereby deny to those still struggling for freedom even their moral support. Here is a phenomenon against which all African freedom fighters must be on their guard and resist to the utmost. Even though I appreciate the difficulties facing us, I must admit I find it strange to watch some of us returning wing willingly to the colonialist fold. This time, they don't even have to, they don't even have the excuse of being forced to subject themselves to foreign domination. It makes one wonder why so much effort and sacrifice and so many lives were given up to the achievement of independence in the first place if it can only be so quickly and easily surrendered. Unhappily for us, colonialism creates in some intellectual allegiances which are not severed at the moment of independence, but remain to condition loyalties away from Africa towards the metropolis, metropolis withdraws them. They are unable, it would appear, to accept the idea that Africans can get together to make, a, to make viable and growing concern of a combined African continent, but rather see their salvation in coming together in association like the Franco-African community mooted recently at Bangui. Although there are many here who speak English, French, Spanish, or Portuguese, nevertheless, we are all Africans. <laughs> Africans fighting for Africa's independence, Africa's unity, Africa's future. I have said that I understand the difficulties of these states which are drawing away from the African community back into that of Europe. Faced with the demands of their people for rising, for rising standards of living and better social conditions, but charged with economies that can hardly meet the recurrent expenses of administration and maintenance, they are in Delhi. And standing at their elbows, are the new colonialist agents buckling them back with a smile into the web of imperialism, though it may have a new look this time and offer the irresistible bit of immediate help. But the help, but the help, this help will be far outweighed as they will experience with no great loss of time by the knots into which their economies will be tied by the Euro-African Association. Imperialism does not change its nature. It only changes its front. It still needs colonial appendages, whether in name or in fact, to exploit and at the same time to support this Cold War strategy. In the face of this serious threat to our economy and independence in Africa, we must begin to build immediately our own continental common market. For it is easy for every anyone who studies the common market organization closely to realize, to realize that the common market is aimed at harnessing the African countries to satisfy the profit loss of the imperialist bloc and to prevent us 
from following an independent neutralist policy. It is easy to see that the imperialists and the colonialists are determined to retain the African countries in the position of suppliers of cheap raw materials. If we do not resist this threat, and if we throw in our lot with the common market, we shall doom the economy of Africa to a state of perpetual subjection to the economy of Western Europe. This will, of course, hinder the industrialization of our young African states. It is impossible to think of economic development and national independence without possessing an unfettered capacity for maintaining a strong industrial power. The activities of the common market are therefore fraught with dangerous political and economic consequences for the independent African states. The, organi the organization constitutes an attempt to replace the old system of colonial exploitation by a new system of collective colonialism which will be stronger and more dangerous than the old evils we are striving to liquidate from our continent. There is an alternative to Euro-African Association with these deadly implications for Africa's independence and progress. It is in an African economic community in which we can all pull our production and our trade to a common advantage. It is not difficult to imagine that the new colonialists would describe this as a pulling of poverty. It is, however, too simple a distortion of fact. Africa is rich and not poor. As the great world that has been taken out of our continent over five centuries of despoliation and extortion, very well proves. Africa has immense actual and potential wealth. Gold, diamond, copper, manganese, bauxite, iron ore, uranium, asbestos, chrome, cobalt, a host of other minerals. Our essential agricultural produce have all been drained away by colonialist imperialism. Africa is far from being poor. It is Africans who are poor, not Africa. <laughs> and they are poor because of the uncounted profit that has been made out of the exploitation of their labor and their lands. If we are being baited to enter a European community, we must have something that community needs and needs badly when it pretends to offer a bonus by way of aid. When Greeks come bearing grapes, should we not look them well in the mouth, <laughs> if I may mix my metaphor, but I'm sure you get my meaning. <laughs> when we, new, untried, inexperienced states, are flattered into European alliance, we enter not as equals, but as suppliers of primary products at the generosity of industrial competitors. How generous they can be, we have learned from our sad experience over a good long time. Who fixes the prices? Who can play off one against the other by allowing the goods of associates in free of tariff and prisoner tariff on others. 
as long as it is possible to deal with this singly, one by one, we are at the mercy of the imperials rather than their generosity. And we shall find ourselves in the same old cleft stake of receiving the lowest possible prices for our raw materials, while those of us who are obliged to buy their manufactured goods because of being members of the association will pay for them through the nose. <laughs> These same states will find themselves tied up in knots which will prevent their going into an open market for their needs of goods and capital investment. And above all, they will lose their option of non-alignment and find themselves dragged into the diplomacy of imperialist Cold War politics, which will operate against the independence and intrinsic interests of Africa. Those of us who cannot see through these implications can only be suffering from an intense myopia. <laughs> Within our African community, our pooled production will place us in a position to bargain for higher prices and so secure greater revenues out of which we can invest in our development. At the same time, we can trade freely among ourselves and buy from ourselves in the cheapest markets. We can turn for aid to those sources which will give us the most suitable terms while leaving us free to follow our own internal and external policy. But more even than this narrow cooperation, we need a wider continental economic plan which will allow us, within unity, to exploit Africa's tremendous resources for our common welfare and greater African development and progress. If, if we are really sincere in our desire to see the end of imperialism in Africa, then, apart even from the consideration involved in African unity, we should turn away from any form of association with Europe, which, through its new colonialist control of our policies, will help rather to sustain that imperialism and undermine it. It is bad enough that our economies, as a legacy of colonial rule, are imperialist controlled, and that we have to strive every means to rid ourselves of this economic imperialism and secure our development and progress on solid African foundations.
forces arrayed against us are, and I use the word most carefully, formidable. They are intense and powerful. They are, as I have taken some pains to explain, the forces of imperialism acting through their instruments, new colonialism and colonialism, ably assisted by the agents of the Cold War. They operate in worldwide combinations at all levels, political, economic, military, cultural, educational, social, and trade. <laughs> and not all, and through intelligence, cultural, and information services. They operate from European and African centers using agents who, I'm ashamed to say, are often on patriotic sons of Africa, buying personal satisfactions with the betrayal of their country's safety and integrity. <laughs> they seduce leaders. They seduce leaders of the African political, trade union, and people's organization, thus creating rifts and quarrels within the national front. On the broader front, they are amassing their forces in a determined effort to stay the advance of African liberation and the march of unity. It is not accidental that the countries of the European common market and those spearheading the Atlant North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the imperialist powers, who have brought in their vassals, Spain and Portugal. Portugal, in fact, since the wars of the Spanish secession, 1700 to 1714, being a protector of Britain, which has enjoyed special trading and unnecessary rights in both Portugal and in the Portuguese territories for over 200 years. It is not difficult to understand, therefore, why Britain has not raised her voice against the atrocities in Angola and other protected Portuguese territories and actually supported Portugal's preposterous crime at Goa in India was an integral part of the metropolitan country. <laughs> the arms and troops that are pouring into Angola cannot be regarded in isolation from the international organization of imperialism and the Cold War militarism with which they are most definitely linked. It is absurd to think that Portugal, one of the poorest countries in Europe, <laughs> is a fact, could support so large an army, so well equipped, as that which he defended her colonial possession in Africa without the active aid he must be receiving from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. <laughs> Nor can we look upon the way in which South Africa is busily building up an armed force equal to any held by the nations of Europe without sending the international implications that are obviously involved. She has, we hear, a secret military pact with Portugal. And the interlocking imperialist interest collected in the Congo and the Rhodesias, Angola and Mozambique, which are also linked with the great mining and financial interests operating in South Africa, create a chain of allies which seriously threatens both the fight for extending African emancipation from colonialism and independence of the new African states. Now that African independence has been achieved, over a large part of the continent and the national consciousness of Africans from north to south, from east to west, is adding momentum to the struggle for independence. Every kind of means is being used by the colonialists to arrest its progress and defeat its objective. They are attempting many methods some sinister, some beguiling, to wreck our efforts. They strike antipathetic postures 
On one side, they perform acts calculated to strike fear. On the other, they try to do hoodwink us with fictitious gifts, which superficially pander to our hopes and aspirations. They are the present attempts to deflect our purpose, to weaken our determination.